Ontario's vaccine passport is now in effect. And for the fully vaxxed, it's making many public spaces feel safer than they have felt in almost two years. But for those who have not gotten the jab, well, some doors are now largely closed to them. With us now on what that side of the equation looks and feels like, we welcome Ontario's former Information and Privacy Commissioner and Kavukian, now distinguished expert in residence, leading Ryerson University's Privacy by Design Center of Excellence. Dr. Quam McKenzie is here. He's the CEO at the health policy nonprofit, the Wellesley Institute, and sat on the Ontario government's advisory table on vaccine certificates. Steve Jordans, professor of psychology at University of Toronto Scarborough. And we welcome Carrie Bowman, assistant professor of bioethics and global health at the U of T's Department of Family and Community Medicine. And it's great to see four familiar faces for a timely and important topic on TVO tonight. Just before we start, we do want to share a little bit of footage here of what went down at the Eaton Center this past Saturday, uh, because, um, well, let's face it, we, we are starting to see more of this, and we suspect this will not be the last we see of these kinds of things. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll that. Okay, these are people who uh, did not want to wear masks and yet wanted access to the Eaton Center. No one knows their vaccination status, of course, but let's just, and Steve, I'll go to you first to start us off first. The vaccine passport system is now in place. It's been with us for a week. How do you think it's working out so far? Um, I, I mean, I think it's the right thing. We, we are now kind of taking this to the level they're at. And, and so for a lot of the people who are anti-vaxxer, it's an emotional response they're having. They, they have a lot of fear about things. And, you know, to some extent, this is an emotional uh, antidote to the sense uh, where we're saying, OK, you have some fear, but you also have all these other things you would like to be doing. We're now going to ask you to choose between them. And, and it's kind of I, I equate it to the father when you have the argument or the father says, that's it. Argument's over. I have the car. I have the keys. If you ever want to drive my car again, you're going to play it my way. And, and that's what they're facing right now is this tough decision of how much do they want to be an anti-vaxxer? How much do they want these freedoms that they're so used to? Quam, based on what you're reading, seeing and hearing, how do you think it's working so far? Uh, well, I'm very worried about it. I must admit, pre-pandemic, we had a two-tier society and COVID made it worse. And uh, I don't think divided societies ever work. And so I'm much more interested in thinking how we can uh, get everybody on side uh, for what needs to be a community effort to uh, beat COVID. And I'm worried about uh, policies which inadvert in inadvertently um, uh, divide us rather than uh, bringing us together. And Kavukian, how do you see it? COVID vaccines and vaccine passports are indeed very divisive. There's no question. The issue is not whether uh, the vaccine works. It certainly appears to work for four to six months, decreasing the probability of uh, contracting COVID-19. But the question is, at what cost? And we also have to be respectful to both sides. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm, I'm a classic liberal. Uh, but I want the sun to shine on the evidence on both sides. And, uh, you know, let the photons uh, disinfect the bullshit. I mean, we just, we just need e equal opportunity and hearing on both sides of the equation. They do say sunshine is the best disinfectant. Okay, Carrie Bowman, what do you say about how things are going right now? Well, look, Steve, it's clearly divisive. And, you know, the question is, from an ethical point of view, is this division justified? And, and so much of ethics is tied to proportionality. You know, we just don't know at this point um, whether it's truly justified. It's obviously having a social effect and um, much of it is, some of it is very negative. Um, I also have my eye, and I'm sure we'll talk about this as, as our session progresses, but what, what are we left with when this eventually ends? In what way does it change our view of ethics? Because I, I find the discourse so far has been very, very black and white, sticks and carrots, uh, no-brainer, slam dunk, all these metaphors. I see it as much more complex than that, and we've jumped in with both feet. I hope it's justified. 
Well, Carrie, let me follow up with you on this, and you can tell us as an ethicist whether public opinion and where it's at, uh, whether that should matter in this case. But the fact is, pass polls do show us that the yeah. vast majority of Ontarians support the vaccine passport idea. They support the notion that if you want to go to a Jays game or you want to go to a gym or a restaurant, other non-essential places, uh, you should have to be able to show some kind of identification mm -hmm. that indicates what your health status is. Uh, you know, are, are you on are you on side with the notion that if 80 percent of the people believe that's the way we ought to do it, then that's the way we ought to do it? Yeah. So that's a strong democratic principle. And look, that's a profound ethical argument. But but I think most of us here and listening would appreciate that, um, you know, majority is a terrible way to protect vulnerability and, and other people's rights. And so that's a great concern. Also, they're on board, but we have no metrics. You know, what's the end point? What's the you know, what are the ins and outs epidemiologically? What will the effect be? It's so blended with other interventions. We may never know that. So although people, I would say, are on board, I appreciate that. Um, I still worry about, you know, how it affects many, many other people within our society. All right, Quam, let me do the follow-up with you, which is, should public policy not favor those who are both in the majority, following health protocols, went and got their shots? Should public policy not favor them? So I should start by saying that I am really very, very pro-vaccination. Uh, I do believe that um, when we look at the uh, four and a half million deaths from COVID worldwide uh, and the uh, actual incredibly low incidence of vaccine uh, problems, uh, that we're in the right place trying to get people vaccinated. And um, if anybody asks me whether I thought 18 months from the start of the pandemic, I'd actually be having a conversation for people's about people's right not to protect themselves, I'd say this is crazy, it's ridiculous, right? Um, and your right not to protect your your neighbour, I'd say I didn't think we'd be having this conversation. Uh, and so I'm very, you know, so I'm very pro that. The question for me is how do you get there, and uh, whether uh, having uh, um, uh, and how you get there in a way that's, uh, uh, that reduces consensus. And so, um, you know, I'm, I, I believe that uh, I am worried that uh, if you go too quickly with vaccine passports, rather than do things that will bring other people along, that you can end up hardening opposition to vaccination. And for me, I think the vaccination is very, very important in order to protect us. Well, let's talk, Steve, about how we got there. The fact of the matter is the government of Ontario has not passed any law forcing people to have the vaccination. They've encouraged people to have it. They've advertised up the yin-yang to make sure people know it's available to them and that it's, generally speaking, good for your health to get it. Uh, w would you have any quibbles or qualms about how we've got to a Basically, I think where we're at 80 percent um, vaccinated status right, or 70 percent uh, double vaxxed right now in Canada. Yeah, I mean, when we really look at how this all evolved, a lot of it started with that original paper that purportedly linked vaccines to autism. And that was a horrible paper that has been discredited on so many levels. It should never have been published in the first place. That was a failure of science to allow that to, to be published. But since then, that combined with social media, the, the power of social media to support any story, whether it's been fact-checked or not, and in fact, to multiply the power of a story, especially one that has an emotional power to it. So when we get hit by an emotional story, it does two things simultaneously. It kind of shuts down our frontal lobes, makes it hard for us to think rationally, and it provokes us to do something. We feel this need to do something. And if you're on social media, you can share, you can like, you can comment. Uh, and so we see a lot of sharing and we see the false information now get a power uh, to surround people that the good information doesn't have uh, because of all the fact checking and the reputation of the sources. So I'm a little surprised by some of these. You know, you can say, is, is the vaccine 100 percent safe? No, but we've got a lot of studies looking at that in detail. Do we know all the long term effects? No. Do we have any reason to worry about them? Not really. There's nothing clear to, to suggest we do. And at the same time, look at the other side of the formula. If we're not going to go with the vaccine, we're going to go with 
what? Is, is it just letting everybody get sick? We know how that turns out. We know there are long-term effects. We know there's over 4 million deaths. The vaccine is our way out. We really need to convince people to do it. This is a divisive approach. That's not fantastic. Um, and what I think you're going to see is some people get really upset, as we saw in the Eaton Centre, and some people quietly get the vaccine. And we need that latter group because we need to reach herd immunity. That's the way out. I, that's the question I would pose to the other people. If not the vaccine, if not to push people to get it, what's the alternative that you have in mind? So, Steve, um, can I just yeah. follow up on that with the other let Steve? Me, let me get Quem first and then Ann Kavuki and come on in after that. Because uh, I do think there are different reasons why people aren't taking the vaccine. You know, there are some people in some populations uh, with historical um, uh, reasons why they're uh, less than uh, comfortable uh, with being made to do things. Uh, indigenous populations, racialized populations and their history in Canada and also with science. Uh, there are people who say they just, you know, haven't had time. They're working two jobs and they're worried about it. There are people who've had bad information and there are people who are anti-vaccination and were anti-vaccination to start off with. So there's, it's not a monolithic group. There are lots of reasons why people haven't been vaccinated. And so I think that when you're in that situation, you sometimes need public policy that tries to take into account all of these different reasons and tries to help people move along. Uh, and, um, I, uh, and I'm worried that we haven't done as much as we could uh, to move people along before we uh, instituted the vaccine passports. And that doesn't mean I don't accept that the majority want them or that it is a viable way forward. I'm just concerned that we need to do more to bring everybody along so that we're working on this as a consensual community. And Kavuki. When we say bring everybody along, with due respect, people are not hearing the scientists, the epidemiologists on arguably the other side. There are so many questions that we do not have answers to. Look at Israel. Israel had so much uh, vaccine right away. And what they found is that there's now considerable anecdotal data from Israel that na natural immunity is up to 13 times, 13 times more protective than a vaccine. So I want to say with due respect, we have to hear from all sides of the equation. And we haven't even talked about the, um, the enormous impact on privacy uh, from vaccine passports. They are creating a new inescapable web of surveillance um, with geolocation data being tracked everywhere. We have a, a global digital infrastructure that is growing literally all around the world. And what about individuals who have anaphylactic, who are immunocompromised, who cannot get the vaccine? There are so many factors to consider. And I should mention with the vaccine passports, which I find highly, highly offensive from a privacy perspective, both Quebec and the uh, port of pass in Alberta have been found, the CBC revealed this, to be incredibly privacy invasive. There's collecting all kinds of personal information that was never intended to be collected. This information is being shared online with a variety of unauthorized third parties. So this is not a slam dunk. That okay, it's just let me jump in here for a not. second, please. Right, and you've to... raised a whole host of issues and, and we, You've raised a whole host of issues, many of which are uh, pretty darn controversial. So I want to get a, some feedback from around the horn from everybody else on some of the things that you've raised. Let's go Quam, Steve, and then Kerry. Okay, so we know that uh, places like um, uh, Sweden decided to go down the line of herd immunity, and they decided uh, very early on that they were going to try that, and it was a monumental failure. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Anne is completely right, um, that um, uh, if you get um, uh, immunity following having um, uh, had uh, COVID, uh, that that is very strong immunity. The problem is if we went down that line, we would have uh, many, 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 many more deaths. Uh, and uh, most people have decided and most countries have decided that's not the way to go. And the issue is that we have got to where we are uh, because of science 
and because science takes anecdote, it takes emotion, it takes um, sort of people's good ideas and it tests them properly. And then once it's test properly, properly, we start making policy based on firm uh, uh, science and firm uh, statistics. And that testing isn't knowledge. taking place sufficiently. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's, and, let's hear Quinn, please. And, and proper knowledge. So all of this gets done. What isn't that useful is uh, not doing the science properly. We use science to get around um, sort of, you know, basically hearsay. Uh, and that is just not useful in, in a pandemic. We need to do the work properly and that's what's being done. Uh, now, I've been lucky enough to not see myself. loads of these data and to see lots of the things that people have put on the table, to see loads of these things that people think might work, and most of them don't. And when they do work, they are being promoted and they are being used. Uh, so I, I think that certainly with regards to where we are at the moment scientifically, I just actually think we're in an amazing place. Ten months after uh, people started, we've got vaccines that work and have been shown to protect millions of people from COVID. It is a modern miracle. And uh, if people want to undermine that, I don't know why they would. Steve, can I have you come in here now, please? Um, sure. Um, I, I think Quam's actually done a pretty good job on some of the stuff that, that Anne's talking about, and it's more medical than, than I can talk to. But I did want to just point out this point about Quam, what Quam said. I, I like that idea of bringing everybody on board, and, and I understand there's a spectrum. The, the thing that we also have to consider is there's a big clock behind us, right? We have to deal with this. If we if we say, okay, let's take another year to use some subtle messaging to try to do whatever, um, that's the time when the next variant is going to come out and, and, you know, take over again. And so if we really want to get the other side of this, we're so close to the herd immunity, we got to get people there. And, you know, that's why I, I support the vaccine passport. I think it is difficult. It, it makes uh, things really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Uh, and, and, of course, those with medical exemptions and such, we have to look into that and make sure they're supported. But in general, this seems to be the best way to get us from where we are now, you know, 80 percent to where we got to be, about the 90 percent. And then we can all stop fighting and be on the other side of this. Um, but the longer we stay in this in this gray zone, and have these silly fights over, you know, pseudoscience versus real science and people promoting mm. certain things, um, then I, I think this is where the, you know, it's not the passport that's divisive. It's it's everything that's led up to this point. We were divided way before the vaccine passport. The vaccine passport is an attempt to get us united, even though some of the group are going to have to, you know, be dragging their feet uh, to do it. Oh. Carrie Bowman, anything you want to say in rebuttal to what Anne said a few minutes back? Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to step back from the epidemiology and, and hide behind the fact that I have a PhD and, and, and it's not an epidemiology, so I step back. I'm not naive, however, and I, I read a great deal. So, you know, that's, that's a major consideration. But, you know, I do hear from students that they're fearful to ever come up with any kind of argument that doesn't fit into the acceptable, this is what we need to do and this is how we do it. And Kwame, I agree with many, many points you're making. I do not agree in the least that science is somehow bulletproof and completely resistant to outside influence. That is simply not the way Western culture works at all. And I think particularly in this pandemic, science has been in a scramble to make decisions quickly without sometimes longer term data. And they've done mostly, I think, a good job. Yeah, and I'd, I'd right. like to agree with you totally, um, Kerry. I don't believe science is bulletproof. I, I actually don't believe anything is bullet, bulletproof. <laughs> and I'm, I think it's great we've got ethicists because I do think that science sometimes makes mistakes, sometimes makes big mistakes, sometimes goes down un, unethical routes. I just think it's one of the better strategies we've got in pandemics when things are fast moving to actually get us to a place that is... Uh, safe and defensible. Uh, I don't think it's perfect. I, I totally agree with you. And I, I actually agree with Steve as well about this idea that, you know, it's fast moving. The issue I have and the worry I have is um, we've got boosters on the horizon. 
we've actually still got five to 12 year olds who are unvaccinated. So we're nowhere near gonna be at herd, herd immunity. And we have to have a strategy, not just for now, but also for the future. And I think if we alienate and we uh, and uh, produce silos for certain parts of the population, that that might be a strategy which gives us problems in the future. And it's a tough call because I have loads of sympathy with what you're saying, but I'm worried about the future and what happens in a few months when we're going to be talking about boosters and how we get there, right? Okay, so let that, me pick up on that, Quim. I want to pick up on that because here's basically what public opinion looks like as it relates to the future that you're all talking about having to manage. This is from Leger, the public opinion firm Leger, and they surveyed Canadians and discovered 77% of Canadians have a negative opinion of those who have not been vaccinated. And even more, 85% of the vaccinated hold a negative view of the unvaccinated. 28% meantime of the unvaccinated hold negative views of vaccinated Canadians. So this is the soup into which we're trying to figure out public policy that could bring along the most number of people. Um, let me just ask the neutral, lean, open-ended question. And anything in those numbers that you find concerning? It's, it's frightening. There's no question. You have to look at this holistically. And Steve, this is something you've always done in the past. I remember in 2010, you had a panel on on uh, climate change with the one pro, one against, etc. What you need to do is to bring on the scientists, the epidemiologists who don't share the views of the ones you have on right now. With due respect, we are heading into a very problematic situation with all the people who are pro-vaccine and the scientists supporting it saying, oh, just ignore the others. You know, they're, they're soft science. They're not doing it properly. That's nonsense. Go to the WHO site. But the problem is with the vaccines and the vaccine passports, let me be clear, this will lead to a highly intrusive system of surveillance. They're calling it vaccine surveillance associated with the collection of your geolocation data, which is linked to all the sites where you're giving this information. And it will totally change any privacy that we've enjoyed in the past. And you let me do a quick follow up with you on this. Let me do a quick follow up with you on this. Is there any information we've had to provide as part of trying to deal with COVID-19 that 99% of us haven't already volunteered to put up on our Facebook, Twitter pages, et cetera, et cetera? That's not the point. I'm sorry, Steve. When you talk about very sensitive health data, health to health information is the most sensitive and the health information deserving of the strongest privacy protection. So when you're demanding people's passport information and have they got a vaccine or not, and they may be medically compromised, immunocompromised, they can't get a vaccine, you are holding so much information against them. And it sort of eradicates um, any liberty and freedom in, in our society, a prosperous and healthy society never threatens its liberty. And that's what we're doing here. All right, Carrie Bowman, from an ethical point of view, do you think there have been privacy issues raised during the course of governments attempting to tackle COVID-19? Yeah, I, I mean, we're just rolling out into the passports now, and I, I, I think there probably will be. You know, we're waiting to see. Um, you know, I, I find it odd just going for a coffee that I have to show something with my, my you know, my uh, name and perhaps other information on there. So that's what, you know, that's what we see. But look, let me just say, from an ethical point of view, the thing that concerns me probably the most about this is it's really not. Some people say, lawyers particularly, we're preserving autonomy. Nobody's being held down to be vaccinated. I would say it's coercive uh, for some. Most of us, including me, we're very happy to be vaccinated. Not everyone is. So this is not autonomy as we know it. This is not free and informed consent if your job is on the line. Uh, if you're about to be fired, I mean, I spoke to someone just a few days ago and they're raising three young children and they're being vaccinated in fear for their livelihood. So we are deviating from free and informed consent. Uh, and, you know, maybe not for the majority of the population, but I really wonder of the effect of the social fabric and if, if ethics will ever recover from this, because the thinking now is I'm going to decide whether you're making good decisions for yourself or not. Not, are you making informed decisions? I'm going to decide if your decisions are good. 
Well, this conversation we're having here may reflect, in fact, a lot of what's going on out there as well. And to that end, I do want, Sheldon Osman, can I get you to bring up a graphic of what the Toronto Star had on its front page uh, back on August 26th? And I'll read some of these headlines that were on the front page of the Toronto Star. I have no empathy left for the willfully unvaccinated. Let them die. I mean, these were the kinds of quotes that the, that the Star later apologized for, I should say, later apologized for. But but we are seeing, and maybe Steve Jordan, as you can pick up on this, we are seeing people vilified for their position on vaccines, for their position on vaccine passports, for their unwillingness to take vaccinations, which let's remind everybody, they are not obliged to take. There is no law telling them they have to take it. I'd like to get some sense um, from you as to what those attitudes particularly when they're splashed on the front page of the biggest circulation newspaper in the country. What all of that does to the mix of things we're talking about tonight? Yeah, I mean, it, it's tricky. We're all trying to have civilized conversations. But yeah, there's a lot of underlying frustration, right? And we're all frustrated. We're all tired of this pandemic. We all want to be able to go back and support businesses and live the life we want. And increasingly among the unvaccinated, there is this feeling that we could be there. If everybody had just done their role, got the vaccination, you know, we could potentially be in a place right now where this would be over. And so everything we're experiencing now, slowly in the mind of the vaccinated, gets put on the unvaccinated. You know, we start to think it's your fault. We are not in a better place now. And we're seeing that happening uh, mixed with what I call the enough is enough effect where you know, it's like a lot of us have tried to have these difficult discussions. And it's really difficult when we get into the weeds of issues of, I read this website and anecdotally it says this and that, and you try to kind of combat that with a, it gets really, really difficult and frustrating. And I think a lot of the unvaccinated are just tired of it. And it is like that point of the father saying, you know, enough is enough, that's it, I'm done. We need to get vaccinated and here's the, here's the path we're gonna take to do it. So I think that's in there and what you see in those quotes this is the unfortunate thing. When people have these sort of underlying frustrations, they can come out in very nasty ways sometimes when it, when the right sort of spark hits. And, and I think that's what you're seeing is that spark. It is that underlying frustration. Um, and, and it's there very strongly in the vaccinated now. Well, Steve, we invited you on this program, obviously because of your, your academic credentials that you bring to this discussion, but you've also got some personal experience on this as well. And... Yep. If you want to talk about that, I'm offering you this invitation too, because your personal family circumstances may be very instructive to others who are watching. You want to share that? Sure. Yeah, sure. I, I would love to. Um, so I have three sisters. Um, the, the sister I've been closest to for all my life uh, is a very firm anti-vaxxer, got there in a very benign way. She was sort of big pharma, big, big food, worried. And I understand all those worries and concerns and think they're valid. But she got pulled to the strong anti-vax position. She has power of attorney for my mother. My mother has Alzheimer's disease and is in long-term care. Um, because of my sister's views, my mother is unvaccinated uh, and will be unvaccinated. And there's absolutely nothing I can do uh, for that. Uh, my sister and I have had a lot of these conversations that I'm sure I could have with Anne, um, that every time we have the conversations, we just feel like we're further apart. And so I've thought long and hard about you know, like how how do we heal as a, as, a, as a country, but also how do we, how do I and she heal? What's the best way to go forward from here? Uh, and so it is a very emotional issue. It's splitting a lot of families. Uh, and, it, and it could, you know, like Kwam says, it could be here after the, the pandemic is gone. This could be the long-term effect many of us are living with is this horrible division that we're facing. And so, yeah, I really do think we need to find ways. I don't think this arguing about details of stuff is where we need to be. Um, I, I think we need to show each other love and support and empathy. And then I quite honestly think as a society, we need things like the vaccine passport to kind of get people um, going in the same direction, that, that arguing isn't, isn't the approach anymore. The rational mind is not up to this challenge. We have to speak to the emotional mind to make this work. Kerry, can you follow up on that? What's the way in here? Well, the opposite of what we've been doing, you know, I did this. Awful election, I say awful because it, it seems like we got nowhere with this entire election. But, you know, to use this as a wedge issue was so destructive and it contributed, I think, to so much more polarization. And the conversation leading up to vaccine passports, I think, was very, very black and white. 
It was dominated almost exclusively by medical voices. We heard very little from anyone that was not directly, and mostly primarily physicians. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's very divisive. And when you look at that headline that we saw in the star, this is destructive. Human nature being what it is, when you set up us and them, and I, I think it's a political win. If someone comes on strong about vaccine passports, they, they sound powerful and decisive in a crisis. I, I, I think it's a win. But, you know, even this carrot and stick business, you know, a carrot is a manipulation and a stick is a form of animal cruelty. Is that, are, is this really the right metaphors for public health? Um, you know, I, I think we've come about this and we've done a lot more damage because of it. And probably we have lower vaccine rates because of our approach. Well, you say we have lower vaccine rates, although our rates are among the highest in the world. And Anne, let me put to you, the Leger survey that I quoted earlier also had this additional comment on it. It said, as street protests over vaccine passports continue across Canada, unvaccinated Canadians are now far more unpopular than language, cultural and religious groups that are generally the object of negative sentiment. I guess I want to know in your view whether or not this pandemic and our vaccination response to it has created a new form of discrimination in the country. Absolutely, Steve. I agree with everything you've just said. And what people don't realize, they're looking at all the short-term benefits of the vaccines, which I give you. They do not know that we have not looked at the long-term effect of the vaccine. We have to have some kind of pause to look at some of these other issues. And in the process, people who are very sensitive and who are saying we're concerned about getting vaccinated because we don't know the answers to these questions, they should be discriminated against in the way they are being. This is what I find so disturbing, is that we are creating this vaccine surveillance, which is mounting on a daily basis, we have the vaccine passports now, and I gave you the two examples. In Alberta, it's called Port Pass, and in Quebec, their vaccine passports. They collect all this personal information, contrary to what's being said by the government. Lots of personal information is being collected and retained that will have an impact upon you and your freedom. Privacy forms the foundation of our freedom. We cannot give that up, so we can't just jump into this without also listening to what, is it, what I'm calling the other side. So, Steve, right, can I just uh, quickly say... Sure, come uh, on Steve, in, Quim. Uh, so, Steve, really sorry to hear about your situation. I probably have shared before that my mother died of COVID and uh, likely uh, died of COVID that was passed on uh, by a care worker. And uh, if uh, I was in a position where care workers had to... Um, uh, be uh, vaccinated and therefore had have a de decreased likelihood of passed on COVID to my mother, I would most definitely be in a situation where I would believe uh, that having uh, vaccine certificates for care workers uh, was uh, really important. Uh, with another hat on as my equity hat on, I know that uh, having uh, vaccine passports will uh, lead to double discrimination for um, uh, some populations, uh, indigenous populations, racialized populations, and other populations who have got much lower levels of uh, vaccination for various reasons. And uh, so some of my caution around it is around thinking through whether we've done everything we possibly can uh, to make sure that um, we do not end up with uh, double discrimination uh, in certain populations. Uh, and so I'm definitely uh, very worried about uh, that and worried and uh, want to make sure that um, all governments are doing enough uh, to try to um, uh, give everybody uh, equitable access to vaccinations because they haven't had equitable access to vaccinations and have properly listened to populations who are really hesitant. And I think in the long term, if we're lucky, we can get to where Denmark is through a consensus approach uh, to uh, their um, uh, to to their um, uh, uh, pandemic. They've got to a point where they're lifting almost all restrictions just at the moment uh, with high levels of vaccination. And so it would be great if we could uh, also get uh, to that level. I got about a minute and change left, and I want to put on the record here what the Ontario Human Rights Commission had to say about this issue. Here is their statement. 
While receiving a COVID-19 vaccine remains voluntary, the Ontario Human Rights Commission takes the position that mandating and requiring proof of vaccination to protect people at work or when receiving services is generally permissible under the Human Rights Code as long as protections are put in place to make sure people who are unable to be vaccinated for code-related reasons are reasonably accommodated. This applies to all organizations. Receiving a COVID-19 vaccine is voluntary. At the same time, the Ontario Human Rights Commission's position is that a person who chooses not to be vaccinated based on personal preference does not have the right to accommodation under the code. Okay, Steve, maybe give you the last word on this. Can you... I mean, presumably, this is the road forward. This is happening. These vaccinations are happening because businesses are demanding them, as opposed to governments are forcing them upon us. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's fair to say, and I think it's also fair to say that you know we we just need uh, some way to go forward. We need a society to feel like there's something we can do, and and it's perfectly reasonable. You know, I understand things that Anne says, and if it was the case that not getting the vaccine had no further consequences, then I would be far more empathetic and far more willing. But by not having the vaccine, you're putting others at risk. Uh, and that's when you start to say, oh, but we have no long-term data. I agree, we have no long-term data, but we have no reason to feel it would be worrisome. Um, and so, therefore, when others are being put at risk, yes, I think the majority in a democracy have the right to say, hey, we want our safety and security and we want our economic freedom. And the only way to do that is to get past this virus. The only way to do that is through vaccination. So, yes, I, I agree with Kwame that we want to, you know, use the emotional lever to kind of get them there. But we also want to treat them with full respect, give them the full information they need to, to feel like, you know, this is a good decision. But we need we can't just sort of spin and argue and meanwhile allow the virus to do its thing uh, or it's going to be bad, bad news. And that's our time, everybody. I want to thank everybody for participating in a uh, truly important and emotional conversation that I suspect <laughs> is happening across society as we speak. Dr. Quam McKenzie, Steve Jordans, Ann Kavukian, Carrie Bowman, good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Bye-bye. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.